Our next session is the man we were missing two days ago, Jonathan Fenby, who has a different view on China than what we heard from Mei Zhang and Arvind Subramaniam. He believes that it is a dragon head, but he's also aware of the snake tails. We discuss China's absolutely resurgent and surging power, and Bob mentioned how they have pulled 400 million people out of poverty, and that is not something you can take away from them, even despite the fact that they have an autocratic government. But the shrapnel from that is beginning to show. And as I was trying to demonstrate that day, it's interesting that the shrapnel is pretty similar to the shrapnel that is emerging and continuing in India. To draw out those similarities of our, our combined desire for growth and the combined riptides of growth, please welcome Jonathan Fenby. Jonathan, the winds brought you here, finally. <laughs> finally, I was stuck in New York for two and a half days by the, with the hurricane. I wish I had some heroic stories, but I was just sitting in a hotel room. <laughs> like that. And then when I got to London on the way here, British Airways said they cancelled the plane. And then at Mumbai Airport, they didn't want to let me through from the international into the domestic side because I only had my jet air ticket on my iPhone. Finally, I got through, so finally I got here. <laughs> Thank you for being here. John, I hope we're not keeping people from their lunch. Uh, no, we are not. I'm we very aware of this. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, you know, as I said, we can't deny the tremendous progress that China has made. They're sitting on 3.2 trillion uh, you know, res dollars of dollars. reserve money, and they're handing money out across the world. Um, you know, earlier we saw the massive American debt, and one wonders why we call them a rich country. But tell me, Jonathan, why do you feel that China is at this tipping point, and yeah. why do others feel that, you know, they're still going to dominate in 10 years? Yes, well, to try to uh, reply quickly, people who look at China today, tend very often to take a very Manichaean view. Either China is going to rule the world or China is going to collapse. There's a book published saying when China rules the world. There's another book entitled The Coming Collapse of China that was published 11 years ago, and we're still waiting for it. We asked the author, when is it, when is it? And he finally said, it's this year. <laughs> so we've got two more months before China collapses, according to that view. Uh, neither, it, neither of those is right. China is somewhere uh, in the middle. It's done enormous uh, things, uh, as Bob Geldof uh, just said. I mean, more people have been lifted out of poverty in a shorter time and made materially better off than ever before in human history. I mean, this is, everything about China is enormous because it's one point three billion people and this huge landmass. But that is an absolutely enormous achievement in human terms. It's also come from the complete chaos and implosion uh, which it was in at the end of the 1970s after Mao, after 30 years of mad uh, experiments by Mao ending with the Cultural Revolution. And in the last 34 years, it's gone from that, when it really was on the brink of collapse at that point, to being the world's second biggest economy uh, and a country with which everybody has to take uh, account. So there's been that enormous achievement. But where China is today is that the model, the economic model, which was used to power that growth, which consisted of cheap labor, hundreds of millions of people coming into the manufacturing sector from rural areas, cheap capital from enormous household savings, which were waiting to be mobilized, and external demand from the rest of the world, particularly from the developed countries, which would buy cheap Chinese goods. So China could have a big manufacturing sector despite the fact that its domestic demand, its domestic consumption, was very weak indeed. It's one of the great ironies, particularly over the last 10 years in China, that here we have the last major state ruled by a communist uh, regime, but the benefactors of that have actually been capital and the equivalent of entrepreneur, well, entrepreneurs and the, the state entrepreneurs too, rather than the workers. Wages make up only 38% of national income in China compared with 65% uh, in the United States. So, those were the three factors that could put it together. But if you look at them now, wages are going up in China. The government is pushing them up in order to, to push up domestic, domestic consumption. Con consumption. Capital is becoming more difficult and more expensive. And external demand has fallen off a cliff, uh, particularly in Europe and also the United States. So that model no longer works. And China knows that it has to rebalance the economy to push up 
domestic consumption above all. But this is a long-term uh, project of, for China. So economically, you've got this rebalancing, which is starting, but is going to be a long-term. And then politically, you have the one-party rule, a repressive one-party rule, where uh, everything is devoted to maintaining the Communist Party as the monopoly power. I mean, for instance, judges in China are obliged to swear an oath, of, an oath of loyalty, not to the country, not to the legal system, but to the Communist Party. So the whole legal system is, is out of kilter there. You've got this, uh, we're, we're going to have a big change of leadership in China next week when the Communist Party holds its five yearly conference. Uh, we, don't know, we know who's going to get to the top, but we don't know what policies they espouse, we don't know what they're going to do. It's all completely secretive, and you have internal feuding, if you follow the Boshi Lai affair recently, real you know, backstabbing, high level Shakespearean politics uh, in lots of ways. But beside that, you've got a society in China which is evolving so fast that the politics, the political system, cannot contain that society anymore. Jonathan, before we come to uh, how the society in China is changing, I just wanted to ask you about this whole model of growth that, and you know, you said that it's reached its limits in a sense, because the rich worlds can no longer buy, mm. and it's an inevitability that as you grow prosperous, people are going to demand their rights, and labor needs more wages. It, <clears throat> it's something that we ask in India all the time, that is there only one route to growth? Is there only one way of bringing people out of poverty? Pavan Sukhdev uh, last year said that, you know, can you really create 350 million jobs <coughs> out of, uh, sorry, I just got a... <clears throat> that can you really create 350 million jobs out of manufacturing, you know, Jaguars or Peugeots or... Mm just cars, you know, that's one strand of growth, but that parallelly, there has to be other ways of uh, bringing people out of poverty. China seems to have reached its limits. America seems to have reached its limits. What lessons can India take, you know? Must we follow that route or can we invent another way? <laughs> well, the Chinese route, we said, you know, has been <coughs> extremely successful because of this combination of circumstances. <coughs> and of course, some people would say, uh, those who believe that China is different from other countries, is an exceptional civilization state, as the phrase goes, which I think is complete baloney. But, uh, you know, those people at that line would say it's also because China has not had democracy and that democracy is very wasteful. Now, I don't believe in that. I think, you know, as with Churchill, it's the worst of all systems except for all the other systems. Uh, and uh, China, but China, that has served China quite well, it must be said, the ability to direct resources at growth in a way that other democracies find it very difficult to do. This is, you know, this is one of the reasons, certainly, for China's success, but this also is reaching its end. Uh, in 2008, when the economy was declining, going into its first serious decline of the century, the government and the Communist Party threw an enormous amount of money at the economy through credit there to get growth going again. But actually, and they launched a big infrastructure project, high-speed trains, the state grid, et cetera. But the amount of money they devoted to that was four times what was actually needed. So you get this vast overspending, misallocation of capital in the Chinese uh, <coughs> model. Uh, the other thing that China hasn't developed much is its services industries, and that's what we're going to see as, as consumption piece. goes up, as, as the next thing. But it's also going to move up the value chain to stop making T-shirts and toys and start making more uh, advanced goods leading to a Jonathan, Chinese aircraft. Actually, the question I was asking is not to be trapped in that manicure yes. debate. And I think every time one tries to articulate this, it sounds as if one is against industry or manufacturing sure. and, you know, that model, which must be concomitant. I think what, what one wants to ask economists every time is that, is agriculture really the unsustainable uh, route that is made out to be? Or is it just that that kind of thinking is not happening? For yeah. instance, what has China done with its agricultural sector. You know, is it really ah. possible that we'll wipe out agriculture? Bob Geldof spoke of a food crisis. Yeah. And I found it fascinating that we've had two farmers who you didn't get to hear, yes. who really don't have grand economic theories, but the simple point they were making is that you can drive us off the land, but where are you going to get your food? So how is it that we speak of a global crisis in food, and yet nobody's looking at making agriculture viable? Well, this is, this is actually China's Achilles heel. 
which is hardly ever written about. I do write about it in my book quite a bit. Uh, farming in China is very inefficient and backward. The basic reason is that the state owns all the land, and therefore the state divides up the land on a leasehold basis. People don't own the land as such. Uh, of a lot of very small plots, which may sustain individual families, but don't lead to efficient, larger scale uh, farming of the kind China needs. And also, as I think you said yesterday, the state can grab back the land at any point it, it wants and build factories or apartments or whatever else it's in it. Plus, China is very, very short of water. In the northern China, the wheat belt uh, around Beijing, uh, water, the water level is falling at a catastrophic rate. Uh, the latest wells have been dug so deep that the water brought up is reckoned to be 30,000 years old. I don't know how you date water, but there. And China has, has it's, this is one of the other great ironies. Here we have a regime, part of whose founding story is that it was brought to power by a peasant revolution. But the peasants have always been ground under by communism in China to feed the urban workers. And China, this is the next great thing China must do to make its agriculture work. In fact, um, it's not something that people know very well, but in Vidarbha, you know, which is our, our, our drought area, but farmers are committing suicide. They're not necessarily because their agriculture mm. is unviable, but because they take loans for water. Yep. And they just have to keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper because the water levels across the country are disappearing and it's become unviable to look for water. You yes, know? Yes, yes. Um, Johnson, to shift the official figure in China is that there are 150,000 riots, you know? I mean, I, I don't know how that statistic doesn't seem to boggle people's minds. Yes. What in a country can create enough unrest for a, even a communist government to accept that there are 150,000 riots? Right, right. What is the moot cause of those riots? Well, these riots, I mean, a lot of them are not riots. They're, let's say, protests, protests. streets, protests. marches, which are, strictly speaking, uh, illegal. And a, pro a mass protest in China is eight people or more. So eight a lot, people. eight people, a lot are quite small, actually. There. In uh, a country of 1.3 billion. billion. Yeah. But still, it is an enormous number. And there's several, I mean, the, the causes, uh, when you go through this, and I've devoted quite a lot of space to this in the book, they, they vary from everything. There may be increases in bus fares, local corruption. The main cause is the grabbing, the requisitioning of farmland by local authorities without proper compensation. And the local authorities do this because they're short of money, and the way they make money is by grabbing land from farmers and auctioning it off for development there. It's over you know, the mis mysterious death uh, of somebody in custody. Uh, there was one uh, police force in uh, Hangzhou in eastern China which listed causes of death in custody. And this included sleeping in the wrong position, blowing nose too violently, no and way. various other things. <laughs> no way. You're making no that way. up. No, no, no. It's, I've got it. It's in my book. There, so, um, that, 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 so there are many, many causes of this. And now what you've got, and interestingly, this has been happening over the last two years, is the middle class have also started to demonstrate in China. Sometimes 10,000 people turning out in big advanced cities on the East Coast. And that is nearly always because there is a project to build a factory, a petrochemical plant, a railway or something else near a middle class housing that's estate. amazing irony. You it's, know? You know, you know, it's property values. It's, it's a NIMBY, as we, we say in England, not in my backyard. Move it somewhere else. And the government always gives way in these cases because the thing they're terrified of is the middle class turning against the regime. But the basic reason why there are all these protests is what I said earlier. Judges work for the Communist Party. The legal system works for the regime. And there's very little point in going to court at all. So you go out on the street instead. You know, Jonathan, it's um, fascinating that you said that the middle class now is beginning to rebel against the development model because it's coming close to them. It's curious. Every time a factory or an industry is set up, it is supposed to be to pull people out of poverty. Yet the poor resist it the most, you know. Now, clearly, industry is an enabler. And I said that earlier, we are able to be here together because of big money, you know. Internet cables, invention, you know, Ian Lipkin's research. It needs big money. What is it that industry needs to do where people feel that it is part of their well-being, you know? It's clearly not, it's not the exercise of the business, it's the way it's done. Yeah. What is lacking? 
Is it environmental concern? Is it the fact that that, that is not part of the balance sheet? Well, it's, 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 it's the way the workers are treated, let's say, and the people involved, obviously, in the factory. And in China, that has improved a lot. I know it's very easy, and it's, it's quite right in a way, to say, here you've got a company like Foxconn, which puts together the iPhones in Shenzhen in southern China. It employs 1.2 million people there. And they work uh, nine, ten hour, uh, the, the, uh, hour days. They do a lot of overtime, too. And in a sense, yes, they are assembly line. They're not really people. They're assembly line, you know, widgets in a sense, putting things together. But most of those people, and a lot of them are young women, come from rural areas where they would have lived far poorer, more deprived lives. So there has been that social evolution in China, and you get that with workers. But I think, as you say, the whole environmental question, and environment in, in its broader way, how industrialization fits into people's lives is tremendously important. And of course, in China, uh, you've had this environmental disaster crisis built up through industrialization. Uh, three quarters of a million people die prematurely every year from uh, air poisoning. Water, I don't want to spoil your lunch, but about 180 Chinese cities take their drinking water directly from rivers into which raw sewage pours. Heavy lead smelters with high lead, uh, dangerously high lead in babies' uh, blood particularly. There are lots of cases of this, etc., etc., etc. And the point is that people feel the environment is not just important from the point of view of the preservation of nature, the ecology. I mean, the Chinese have never actually liked nature very much. They have all these lovely paintings of Chinese nature, but uh, as Mao said, we've destroyed the bourgeoisie, now we must declare war on nature, because nature was seen as confining the growth of China. But the trouble is that the, 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 the disregard for the environment surrounding people's lives means that they, they, at some point they start to see industrialization as a threat rather than a means of improvement. But Jonathan, that's the frustration, you know, that every time one tries to speak for the environment, it's seen as a bleeding heart cause, yes, you know, yes, yes. and one keeps trying to drive the economic value, you know, the fact that ecology is economy, you know. Mm. So, so as an economist, is it really impossible for industry to be environmentally conscious and still be viable? Why is it not part of the business of business? Yes. No, I think it is possible, indeed, but I mean, again, since we're talking about China, the China is an example of how not to do it, if you like, because what happened with Deng Xiaoping when he unleashed the whole economic reform thing was he got local authorities and local communist parties into business, basically. So you have, let's say, a polluting factory, and there are documented examples of this, somewhere in China, and the local authority has a 30% interest in this factory. Beijing, and the, the, the environmental rules in Beijing are as strict as any in the world. They decide to send an inspection team in. They tell the local government, ah, oh, the inspection team is arriving in a month's time. The local government tells the factory owner, and suddenly the factory becomes absolutely squeaky clean. All pollution stops, all into rivers, whatever it may be. The, the, the smoke is absolutely pure. Everything is perfect. The team arrives, says, bah, 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 very good, very good, 10 out of 10 goes away and the pollution starts again. You have 10,000 environmental bureaus in China, but they're all part of the local government. They have no independence. So this is you know, a perfect example of how not to do it, that you have very strict rules at the center, but the implementation is left to people who've actually got an interest often in pollution. So before we move to the whole advent of social media in China and what it's done, just one last question. You said this is a model of how not to do it. Can you tell us a model of how to do it anywhere well, in the world? Oh, anywhere in the world. Oh, in Scandinavia. It's pretty Scandinavia. Scandinavia. We always bit, hold up Scandinavia as an example. That's size, you know, it doesn't put in, you know. uh, No, I mean, in some parts, some, some, some American uh, environmental measures have certainly taken root. I think because you've got democracy, and because a lot of people do actually see the need for... No, but, but if they're able to stop pollution for the, for the time that it's being inspected, why, why can't that be the norm? Is it too expensive it's to It's too that? expensive. I mean, I, I met once a power station operator in southern China, and the fines are so low that he said it was much cheaper to pay the fines than to install, you know, ecologically uh, friendly equipment. That's... 
It comes down to money in the end. And, and it comes down to hierarchy, because as you course, said, that yeah. you would never have this in your own background, uh, in your own backyard, backyard but yeah. you're willing to do it in other people's yes, backyards. Yes, absolutely. And that's where the protests and resistance comes yep, from. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Jonathan, what about the social media? You know, we've seen its impacts elsewhere. What is it doing to this country that is impervious to the rest of the world? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, I, I think this is the most important potential game changer in China, because what you've got is, uh, I won't go on too long, but in this century, you've had the, the evolution of a middle class in China for the first time in Chinese history. Depends how you define them, but let's say 100 million people, roughly, mainly urban. Uh, and those people have been very well looked after by the regime. And frankly, this is one of the great reasons why China has not had the equivalent of the Arab Spring or democracy, because myself, if I was a middle class family member in Shanghai, with a nice apartment, company car, second car for the family, private health care, and health care is terrible in China if you can't afford to pay for it, private education, ditto. I put something aside for my pension. I have two foreign holidays a year. The last thing I want is for 700 million peasants to have the vote and push their own interests. So the middle class in China is a status quo conservative group, unlike, uh, I remember when I was in Hong Kong editing the paper there and Bill had dinner with Bill Clinton, That's, you do that when you're an editor, as you know. Uh, and Clinton said, this was 1998, 99, we must uh, push uh, economic growth in China because that will mean the evolution of a middle class, which will then push for multi-party democracy. This is how China will become democratic. No, that's just been proved completely wrong. The Communist Party has played it very, very cleverly indeed so far. The trouble is that they are losing I think they're in danger of losing the support of that middle class. And the middle class now communicate, and not just the middle class, other people, through social media. And you have the state and the Communist Party, which controls all media in China. You're, you're not allowed to set up a media organization independent of the state, the Communist Party, or the army uh, in China. But controlling social media, when you've got, well, the official number of social media users in China is 340 million. That's actually an overstatement because several people have several accounts. People often have several accounts, but it's lots and lots of people, and you can't control this anymore. The censors, the 30,000 cyber cops who keep a watch on the internet, they're running behind the whole time, uh, and so you've now got this happening. Uh, for instance, uh, you get rumors being floated, sometimes extraordinary rumors, but they shoot round like wildfire, and then you have what are called human flesh searches in China. Sorry, human? human flesh searches. It's a rather macabre name for what is in fact vigilante activity. People go for an official who they don't like and you get this storm on social media against him. And one, the most recent case, was a man who was a health and welfare officer in Shaanxi province in northern China. And he was photographed by somebody on their phone, mobile phone, laughing at the scene of a bus crash where 30, 30 people have been killed. He was kind of going, ha, ha, ha. So it became known as the laughing official. And then somebody noticed that he had a very expensive Swiss watch, which would have cost the equivalent of his official salary. And then people did a num lots of other searches for photographs of him. And they found that he always had a different expensive Swiss watch on. So this became enormous, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of people got involved in this and so on. And eventually the authorities had to act and they raided this man's house and found that he had 82 Swiss watches at home <laughs> and he's been sacked. What? <laughs> you know, what will happen to him, we don't quite know. So, you know, there is this... Uh, there's another lovely story about this house uncle who, uh, another Chinese official, I think, who has 22 properties. Yes, yes, and yes. And the yes, social yes, media yes. went after him. After him, yes, yes, him yes. And then a famous case of uh, a waitress in a bathhouse who stabbed an official who was trying to molest her, and he died. And she was initially ar arrested and probably would have been executed as well. As this. But there was such a social media storm that she was freed, and she's now being offered, we're told, a starring role in a soap opera on oh. television. So. <laughs> So, uh, Jonathan, where does America fit into this? You know, so when Arvind was on the stage, I kept evoking Banco's ghost, which was yes. you, you know. It was me, well. <laughs> <laughs> but now if I were to evoke Arvind's uh, argument, he believes that America, if it's not already subservient to China, mm -hmm. will definitely be subservient to China in eight years, you know. So he's got a little more time than yes, two I, months. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. What would you say to his argument? <sighs> Well, I mean, the balance has changed, clearly. On an economic uh, front, China is 
second to America. If you take purchasing power, uh, it's probably equal or even ahead of America. But divide that by 1.3 billion, and of course, per capita, you get there's, there's a huge difference there. Um, I think that, that it's, uh, I would say that that argument you just put actually overstates China's uh, importance and growth in two ways. First of all, you referred to the, the three trillion plus. Uh, holdings that China has in foreign exchange, of which probably about half is in dollars. But actually, China is caught by that. It's what we call the dollar trap, because China can't sell those dollars. If it sold a little of them, or if it even hinted it was going to sell those assets or stop buying dollar assets, the dollar would plunge and the rest of the assets would be worth practically nothing. It's the other thing. If you owe your bank 100 rupees, you may have a problem. If you owe your bank a million rupees, it's the bank that's got the problem. <laughs> and it's, it, that's, the, that's the way around it is, which, strangely enough, the Americans don't seem to fully realize. Hillary Clinton says, you know, how can I deal toughly with China on human rights? How do you talk tough to your banker? <laughs> but actually, you do talk tough to your banker when he's in hot to you, uh, in a way. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that on the, and this is not so much economic, this, this is, is more broadly uh, in, in terms of China, the great superpower that is coming. China has been remarkably unsuccessful or unwilling to translate its economic clout into political clout. It plays practically no role in international politics. It isn't a superpower in the sense that Britain was in the 19th century and America in the 20th century. Uh, China, you know, it, come, it complains a lot about the international system, about the financial system. It comes up with hardly any propositions of its own. It's just, it, it protects uh, despots, you know, the Syrians, they, they're but, the but best so friends. so have the Americans protected despots. Of course, of course, <laughs> but China has now, it, it does that, not the Americans, I think, did it for, for very, perhaps for political reasons, in part. The Chinese do it really for two reasons. They're foreign, they're, I'm tempted often to say, I, I read a paper for the London School of Economics uh, arguing uh, about two months ago, China actually has no foreign policy. This is a problem because its foreign policy consists of access to raw materials, which it needs around the world, and protecting the powers that supply it with that, and making sure nobody interferes with its internal affairs, particularly over Tibet and Xinjiang. And that's it. You know, there's nothing. You don't know where China is. You don't know what it stands for. And that being the case, it cannot, I don't think, become this great global superpower, partly because it actually doesn't want to. It's got so many problems at home, China, with the environment that you talked about, with wealth disparities, uh, with corruption, with the whole legal system, with demography. China is getting old very fast. It'll get old, ri old before it gets rich, uh, uh, as the saying goes, with what I call the trust deficit in China, where nobody trusts anybody anymore. There's the phrase, I'm sure you may say it in India, we would certainly say it in Britain, only believe something when the government denies it. But that is very true in China. You've got food scandals the whole time. The biggest sausage manufacturer found to be putting rotten pork into sausages, etc. Milk powder. There uh, was that baby, baby, baby milk powder. powder. Yeah, 300,000 children, no. six died, affected. I've just been in the United States uh, with uh, the head of our, I run a research service on China, and I was just in America with the Chinese head of our Beijing office. He has a 16-month-old uh, child, baby, and every time he goes abroad, he comes back with suitcases full of milk powder. We went into a supermarket uh, in Connecticut one day with two huge bags and just cleaned the, 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 the shelves. Everybody was looking at us, who are these madmen, you know, taking all the baby powder? But it's that kind of trust deficit. And then the whole question of uh, what, what drives China at the moment, and I maybe seem to be being unfairly critical here, but if you're looking for an ism for China, it isn't Marxism anymore, it's not Confucianism anymore, it's materialism. It's, you know, we're all materialists, of course, but the, one of the famous sayings, I mean, two things in China, just say, uh, sayings which anybody will recognize. A young lady on a television dating show in Jiangsu province a couple of years ago, she was asked, what will you be looking for in a young man? And she said, look, I'd rather cry in the back of a BMW than laugh on the back of a bicycle. <laughs> now, a lot of us might say that too, but this is a saying you get throughout China. No, in fact, it's, it's amazing, and it's in the spirit of uh, honest discussion that, you know, we've had here that Mei Zhang, who's yes. the head of Wild China, yeah. she admitted sitting here, she said, you know, my class of people, we don't really care whether we have liberty or not because of precisely the same reason that you yes. said. She said, we are too comfortable and we yes. don't care. We might say it in private, but 
we don't do it. We you know, the other saying is, in China today, it doesn't matter who you are, what you think, what you do, all that matters is what you can afford. So on. And on the corruption side, sorry, I just did one. There was a Southern Weekly, which is one of the best uh, Chinese magazines, uh, did a survey of primary school children. What do you want to be when you grow up? And they all said a pop star, a big business person, this, that, and the other. And a six-year-old girl said, I want to be an official. And the reporter, he wrote afterwards, said, this is wonderful. I thought, finally I found a child who wants to serve the state. Tell me, young lady, what kind of official do you want to be? And the six-year-old said, a corrupt official. <laughs> because they have all the nice things. <laughs> so this society is tremendously, and, and the social media fits into that because it gives a means of complaint and communication to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, Jonathan, we stole some time for Bob, yes. so I'm going to wrap this up yes, very quickly yes, yes. Uh, because we're running behind time. Two quick questions. One is, you know, you said China has no foreign policy, but China is actually really flex flexing its muscles uh, in the Middle East, in Africa, which mm, really yeah. is going to be the next yeah. theater of global politics, you know? What is it doing in Africa, and, and you know, why are people so concerned? Africa and Latin America now, actually. It's the next place is Latin America it's going to. Uh, they're concerned because the Chinese, they, they, they approach Africa, individual countries, as to invest in, to get the raw materials that they can get out of, China, uh, out of the country. That has, of course, collateral benefits for those countries, but very often the Chinese bring in their own workers, for instance. Uh, they're not really operating for the, the good, the benefit uh, of those countries, I don't think. And they are completely blind as to the nature of the regime, as we see in Zimbabwe. So, you know, in, in, in the fact that there's going to be a political change ne next week, you know, just as we wrap this uh, yes. event, why do, you you know, why do you imagine that there's going to be any political change? You know, when you're saying that the middle class is pretty happy, pretty happy as yeah. it is, yeah. uh, and so that economic prosperity is going to bring more and more compliance. So. Where does the trouble lie? Why, why do you believe that the political framework might implode now? The, the trouble is that there's a big leadership change. Five of the seven uh, people who run China uh, will be replaced at the party congress next week. The new guys are more pragmatic than the outgoing guys, let's say. But they're all, in the end, have the bottom line of keep the Communist Party in power. And without going too much, I'm Basically, the whole economic story in China has been a political story. Deng Xiaoping took over in 1978, and he saw China was collapsing and the Communist Party was collapsing. He was a lifelong communist and a Chinese patriot, and he saw economic growth as the way of making China a great power again, but above all, of maintaining Communist Party power. And this is the problem. If the economy starts to slow down, the political leadership may run into problems precisely with that middle class because they can't deliver exactly the same return. But also I think that, you know, there is, I don't want to be too uh, broad, but there is a human spirit in China now which you find among the middle class despite what we said about materialism there. They are much more open, they go abroad, they know how the world works. And this constrained political system, I think at some point, is either going to have to uh, reform itself. This isn't necessarily multi-party democracy, but it's going to have to be much more uh, <coughs> uh, accessible, much more responsive to those social changes that are happening, or it'll risk implosion. And that's why I think in the end, probably democracy is rather a good thing, because it does avoid that crisis. And on that high note, Jonathan, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Sorry. That one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, we shall <laughs> Thank you.